Little Pee Wee, the meanest man in America, the redneck ripper, the hitchhiker slayer. These are all nicknames given to just one man, a lifelong criminal, sexual sadist and raging psychopath. That man is Donald Henry Gaskins, who, if believed, confessed to be the most prolific serial killer in American history. Let's profile this psychopath. Donald Henry Gaskins was born March 13th, 1933, in Florence County, South Carolina. His mother, Eula Parrott, was unwed and Donald never met his father or even knew who he was. Donald's mother had a string of violent boyfriends, most of which would abuse and beat Donald and his siblings. She did eventually go on to get married, but instead of stabilising the wretched home life that befell Donald and his siblings, it worsened. Eula married a harsh disciplinarian who would beat his wife and stepchildren any chance he got and for any reason he could think of. Donald and his siblings were completely neglected by their mother and stepfather. Eula was more interested in drinking and partying with the men in her life, leaving the children to fend for themselves. Needing to find food for himself and his siblings, Donald would shoplift in the local stores or burglarise the homes in his neighbourhood. Before long, he developed a reputation as a troublemaker. In 1944, Donald, who by now was known to the community as Little Pee Wee, dropped out of school at age 11. Instead of receiving education, Donald and two other adolescents formed a small gang who became notoriously known as the Trouble Trio. The Trouble Trio went on burglary sprees, breaking into countless homes and establishments. However, one night, Donald convinced the two other boys to gang one of their own sisters. After that night, the two other boys quickly left the district, and the Trouble Trio disbanded, leaving Donald to operate on his own. In 1946, Donald was in the process of a residential burglary, and he was interrupted by a young girl who he knew as a former classmate. She recognised him too, and tried to scare him off by wielding an axe. However, Donald quickly subdued her, retrieved the axe, and struck her with it, hitting her in the arm and the head. He presumed she had died from the head wound, and so made his escape. The girl survived, however, and went straight to the authorities, naming Donald as the attacker. He was found guilty of the crime and sentenced to the South Carolina Industrial School for Boys until his 18th birthday. Donald would later claim that on just the second night at the school he was ambushed by 20 boys and repeatedly raped. In order to survive, he claims he sought protection from the dormitory boss boy in return for sexual favours. It was during his time at the school that Gaskins truly began to explore the deep hatred he had for women. The hatred had been there since he could remember, but the long nights at the school gave him ample time to ruminate. He hated women, because his mother had failed him his entire life, and it was a woman who caused him to be sent to the school where he was raped and abused. When he was released in 1951, his hatred ran deeper and darker than ever. Upon his release, Donald found work on a tobacco plantation, which was strenuous and badly paid. Before long, he discovered it much more profitable to just steal part of the crop, then set fire to the barn in which it was stored, destroying the evidence and concealing his theft. Gaskins was also being paid by farmers to burn down their own property so that they could then collect the insurance money. It was during one of these fee burnings when Pee Wee found himself in trouble again. Word had quickly spread and soon everyone was talking about Gaskins burning barns for money. The daughter of one of his employers made the mistake of teasing him about the rumours. After being taunted and seething with rage, Gaskins grabbed his hammer and attacked her, striking her several times with heavy blows to the head. 
The girl survived, but her skull was severely damaged and cracked open, requiring extensive surgery. Gaskins was promptly arrested and charged with arson and attempted murder. Donald was acquitted of the arson charge and was somehow able to bargain the second charge down to assault and battery. Instead of a 20 plus year sentence, he was only sentenced to 5 years. Actually, it went up to 6 years after he swore at the judge. When Donald entered the prison, he was determined to not become a target of abuse, nor be ridiculed because of his small stature. As soon as he became familiar with the jail, he located the most feared inmate and slit his throat, thus elevating him in the prison hierarchy. As a result of this attack, Donald was charged with manslaughter, earning him a further nine years. Gaskins was paroled in August of 1961 and returned to Florence, South Carolina. He quickly returned to his career of burglary, but was able to escape detection for a long time. He got the job of chauffeuring a roving preacher and would commit burglaries in the many different towns they travelled to. As they left the area very quickly, his crimes were impossible to trace. His luck did run out in 1962, however, when he was arrested and charged with the statutory rape of a 12-year-old girl. He managed to escape from a courthouse window whilst awaiting trial and joined a travelling carnival, but he was quickly recaptured and sentenced to eight years behind bars. During this last incarceration, Donald made a promise to himself that if and when he next attacked someone, he would not leave them alive to identify him. He kept this promise, and thus his killing career began. When he was paroled in November 1968, Donald was a fully-fledged psychopath with an obsessive hatred of everyone, especially women. It took him less than a year of freedom before he committed a murder. In September 1969, he picked up a young female hitchhiker on a road near Georgetown on the South Carolina coast. Whilst driving, Donald casually suggested sex, in which the young woman laughs in reply. In a rage, he beat her unconscious, raped her, mutilated her and disemboweled her, before dumping her remains in a swamp. This first murder was a pivotal turning point for Gaskins. The act of killing, in his mind, was completely justified. Later, he would say, quote, I am one of the few that truly understands what death and pain are all about. I have a special kind of mind that allows me to give myself permission to kill. Over the next few years, he would give himself permission many, many times. In November 1970, he raped and murdered his own niece, 15-year-old Janice Kirby, and her 17-year-old friend, Patricia Alsbrook. The pair rejected his sexual advances, and so he beat them both to death. He buried their bodies out in the countryside. His next murder is believed to have taken place on March 29, 1972, in Sumter, South Carolina. Gaskins later detailed that he picked up 20-year-old Martha Dix as she walked home from a nightclub. Gaskins recognised the girl as they had briefly met when she entered the car repair shop where he was working. Martha Dix's body has never been recovered and Donald was never able to give details on where to find her. He could not remember her name but his description of her matched what was on file and his timeline was perfectly in line with when she was reported missing. His next murder is one of contention. In December 1970, 13-year-old Peggy Cotino was abducted, raped and tortured to death. However, Donald Gaskins was never charged with her murder. Another man was. William Pierce was a serial killer who in 1971, was convicted of at least nine murders in three different states. One of these charges was the murder of Peggy Cotino, despite there being little evidence. 
After his capture, Gaskins confessed to murdering Peggy and was able to detail the circumstances in which it happened. William Pierce's attorney appealed to have Peggy's murder transferred to Gaskins, but the court denied the motion and Gaskins was never charged. Many, including the FBI, believed that Gaskins had murdered the girl. Gaskins was working in the town on the day she was abducted, and he provided details that only the killer would know. In 1973, Gaskins committed arguably his most horrific murder, or at least his most infamous. Donald murdered Doreen Dempsey, who was a friend to the Gaskin family. Not only that, but he also murdered her two-year-old daughter, Robin. He would later take investigators to a place known as Alligator Landing, a lake right next to one of Gaskin's homes, where they would find their skeletal remains. Donald confessed that after drowning Doreen in the lake, he then raped the child, then killed her by hitting her in the head with a hatchet. Years later, when talking to a family member, Donald said he raped the child because, quote, I just couldn't resist it. His reason for killing Doreen was because she slept with a black man. Robin was murdered because she was mixed race. 1975 proved a turning point in Gaskin's killing career. All his previous murders and cleanups were committed alone, but 1975 saw him recruit help. One night, Gaskins came upon three people, two 20-year-old women and one 20-year-old man, standing next to their broken-down van. He stopped behind them, made out as if he was going to help, but quickly turned on them. It's been reported that he forced them all to engage in group sex before castrating the man and then killed them all. Aware that he could be seen at any moment, Gaskins telephoned an ex-con friend of his named Walter Neely. Walter drove the victim's van back to the garage so that Donald could repaint it and sell it whilst Gaskins disposed of the bodies. Walter Neely would be called upon for other murders to come. Gaskins also broadened his murderous horizons by accepting contract killings. In 1975, Suzanne Kipper paid Donald $1,500 to murder wealthy farmer Silas Yates, who was Suzanne's married boyfriend, who she was angry with and jealous of. Donald accepted the quick cash offer, and along with two associates, John Owens and John Powell, they set out their plan. On February 12th, Gaskins recruited Diane Neely, Walter Neely's ex-wife, to knock on Silas's front door with a story about her car breaking down. When Silas followed her to her car, Gaskins was waiting and at gunpoint abducted him. He drove Silas out to some woods, where he was murdered and buried. Unbelievably, Diane Neely and her boyfriend, ex-con Avery Howard, despite knowing Donald's history, decided it was wise to try and blackmail the killer. They demanded he pay them $5,000 cash in hush money. Donald, in a jam, agreed to meet the pair and to pay the ransom. As a shock to absolutely no one, when they met, Donald quickly subdued the blackmailers and murdered them. With the help of Walter Neely, they were buried in the same woods next to Silas Yates. In September of 1975, neighbourhood girl, 13-year-old Kim Gelkins, went missing. Kim had caught Donald's eye and he had made several sexual advances towards her, all of which she angrily rejected. After her last rejection... Gaskins abducted her at knife point and drove her to nearby woodlands. Once there, he raped her several times before torturing her and strangling her to death. She was buried in a shallow grave in the woods. The following month, two locals, 15-year-old Johnny Knight and 29-year-old Dennis Bellamy, 
obviously unaware of who Gaskins was, made the mistake of robbing him at his own repair shop. It didn't take Gaskins long to track the pair down where he murdered them both. With Walter Neely's help, they were buried out in the woods. Gaskins, considering Walter a trusted ally, showed him the graves of other people that he had murdered, buried nearby. As Gaskins carried on with his life without a care in the world, he was unaware that police were busy investigating the disappearance of Kim Gelkins, an investigation that would lead to his downfall. During their investigation, officers were inundated with tips and were able to gather many pieces of circumstantial evidence, all of which pointed towards Gaskins. Not only had he been seen by many people in the area they believed Kim was abducted from, but Kim's family all reported that Kim had complained many times that Gaskins had made lewd comments towards her. With all the evidence mounting, investigators obtained a search warrant and so convened at Gaskins' apartment. During their search, they uncovered items of clothing they knew belonged to Kim Gelkins. They now knew that the two had met, although they did not have enough evidence to charge him with murder. They were able to arrest and charge him for contributing to the delinquency of a minor and for a charge of auto theft. With Gaskins behind bars, police knew that he could no longer influence or intimidate Walter Neely, who they highly suspected to have aided Gaskins. They piled on the pressure and very quickly Neely broke down and turned state's evidence. Neely accompanied officers to an area of land that Gaskins owned in Prospect. There, police found eight bodies, Johnny Sellers, Jesse Ruth Judy, Avery Howard, Diane Neely, Johnny Knight, Dennis Bellamy, Doreen Dempsey and Little Robin. They finally had the evidence against Gaskins. The state's coroner that performed the autopsies of the bodies was able to determine that all the information Neely had given detectives was true. As such, on April 27, 1976, Walter Neely and Donald Gaskins were charged with murder. They would both face eight separate trials for each victim, and if found guilty, they would both face a death penalty. On May 24, 1976, Gaskins went on trial for murder. Four days later, after hearing all the evidence, the jury found Gaskins guilty and sentenced him to death. Gaskins, not wanting to face another seven death sentences for the other murders, began to bargain for his life. He offered to take investigators to the burial sites of victims that they were never even aware of. However, in November 1976, the US Supreme Court declared South Carolina's death penalty law invalid, and so Gaskin's sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. Astonishingly, Gaskin's killing career was still not over. Gaskin's last murder was one that police thought impossible, but if Gaskin's was anything, it was that he was an efficient killer. Once Gaskins was settled into his new prison, he became aware of another inmate named Rudolf Tyner. Tyner, who was mentally impaired, had passed through North Carolina with friends when they decided to rob a convenience store. After the group left the store, Tyner went back inside and shot the owners, a husband and wife, in their heads with a sawn-off shotgun. Tyner was sentenced to death and has sat on death row for seven years. The convenience store owner's son, Tony Simo, had lost patience with the justice system and demanded retribution. Through connections in the jail, Tony Simo arranged to talk to Gaskins to possibly strike a deal. Tony, can I help you? Pop, I don't, it's collector Tony, my name is Gerald McCormick. 
Hello? I have a cut phone call to Tony from Joe McCormick. Will you accept? Yes, I will. Thank you. Are you Tony? Yes. Fine. Thank you. Tony? Yeah. Joe wanted me to call you. He said, Tony, this is Dr. calling you. Uh-huh. Gaskin's daughter had caught wind of what her father was planning and informed police, but they waved it off, saying it was impossible to murder someone in prison, even more so when on death row. Gaskins got to work on his plan. First, he befriended Tyna, slipping him luxury items that were prohibited to death row inmates. After delivering several of these gifts, Gaskins started to bring him food such as candy bars and other junk foods. Unbeknown to Tyna, Gaskins had poisoned most of the food, which Tyna himself consumed along with some of his friends. However, instead of killing him, it just made him and the others sick. We give that son of a bitch all of it but one dose, and all of us are doing is making that son of a bitch sick. We put it in some damn book for him to drink the other night, and he drank, and two more drank, and all it was made all three of them sick as hell. Gaskins had to come up with another plan. Gaskins managed to get the position of prison handyman and as such, he was able to get all the tools he needed for repairs. He told Tyner that he wanted to set up a communication system between their cells, like a rudimentary telephone. Tyner's and Gaskin's cells were next to each other, so he explained that the device could be pulled through the vent that ran between the cells. Gaskins took one of the heavy plastic prison cups melted a hole in the bottom with a soldering gun and inserted a plug into it. This would be the end that Gaskins would hold in his cell. In the other end, the end given to Tyna, there was a blasting cap and plastic explosives. I come up with something, it can't be no damn making sick on it. I need one electric cap and as much of a stick of damn dynamite as you can get. Okay, well, uh, I'll probably get it. At least the plastic explosion. Well, that'd be good. I'll take a damn radio and rig it in that bomb, and when he plugs that son of a bitch up, it'll blow him on in the hell. Just listen for the bang. <laughs> with the device built, he connected them with wires and threaded it through the vent into Tyner's cell. Gaskins explained that if Tyner held the device up to his ear, he would be able to hear him talking. As soon as Tyner raised the device to his ear, Gaskins plugged the other end into the mains, which detonated the device. Tyner was killed instantly in the blast. His head suffered catastrophic damage, and body parts were blown across the cell. Gaskins quickly pulled the wires back through the vent, cut them up, and then flushed them down the toilet. Then he left the cell, and joined the rest of the inmates who had gathered on the landings. Unfortunately for Gaskins, his own greed caught up to him. He had recorded every phone conversation with Tony Simo, as he planned to use them later to blackmail him. Investigators discovered the tapes and charged him with murder. At trial, Gaskins was found guilty and sentenced to death. This time, there would be no U.S. Supreme Court rulings to spare his life. On September 6th, 1991, at 1.10am, Donald Henry Gaskins was executed by electric chair. His last words were, quote, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go. When Gaskins was dead, Investigators continued to follow any leads that they had received in the 90 plus cases of murder that Gaskins had confessed to. The majority of these claims could not be corroborated and many officials believed Gaskins highly exaggerated the number of murders to appear bigger and badder than he actually was. We will never know just how many people Donald Gaskins murdered it could be argued that he killed many more than those that have been officially pinned on him, 
as it's unlikely that he would or could go years without killing. People like him do not stop. But from the ones we can confirm, we know that he is one of the most disgusting and disturbing serial killers of all time. He completely lacked compassion, and murdering someone meant absolutely nothing to him. People were put onto this earth to be used, abused and discarded. I know that there are many people who do not believe in capital punishment, and I myself do not fully believe in it, but if there was anyone who deserved to die for their crimes, it's Donald Gaskins. Thank you so much for joining me on this video. This is by far the most in-depth content this channel has ever made and I hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for episode 2 of Profiling a Psychopath coming soon. Thank you again. Long days and pleasant nights. <laughs>